Welcome everybody to this uh, session. Um, my name is Chris Hune. I'm the Anaerobic Digestion and Bioresources Association Chair. For those of you uh, who weren't there last night, I see a few people in the audience who are still nursing um, the remnants of uh, last night. Very good to see you. Um, I'm delighted to be chairing this session because one of the things that anybody involved in this sector wants to know is how fast are we going to grow? And I don't think anybody who's been here for the last two days can be in any doubt that the sector is going to grow, but there are an awful lot of variables that go into a forecast of how quickly the sector can grow. It'll be feedstocks, it'll be planning, it'll be regulation, it'll be government support for the carbon benefits uh, of uh, uh, digestion, of biogas, all of these factors, uh, and indeed the end price for digestate. Uh, so all of these factors are going to have an impact on how rapidly uh, the sector grows. And the best organization with an overview of the global industry, because it's an overview of global energy, is the International Energy Agency. I don't know if we have Tim on the screen. Is he here? Yes, good. Tim, welcome. Thank you very much for joining Thanks. us. I don't know whether you heard that introduction, but I was sort of rather building, yes, you, I did. building you up. Uh, quite rightly, as the reference point. I mean, I'm an ex-economic forecaster, so I'm a reformed economic forecaster, and I know, as well as anybody else who's ever done economic forecasting, that you never get everything all right, and a large part of forecasting is actually just to make sure you have a consistent view of the future which actually hangs together. But the reference point in the energy world is the International Energy Agency. And I'm delighted to introduce Tim Gould, who's the chief energy economist of the International Energy Agency, to give uh, his view of where we're going and uh, how important the sector can be uh, in getting us out from under the short run crisis that has been created by the Russian invasion of Ukraine but also the longer run uh, potential benefits of a decarbonized, dispatchable source of energy. Really important, unlike solar, unlike wind, you can actually turn biogas on and off. And so it's there in those long winter nights in the Northern Hemisphere when you haven't uh, got any solar and you can have periods when you don't have any wind. So uh, Tim, over to you. I think you've got a presentation. I know you've got a very uh, uh, a hard meeting you need to get to at 11.15, so we'll bear that in mind when it comes to the question and answer session, but please take it away. Well, thanks very much indeed, uh, Chris, and it's a great pleasure to join you. Um, I think you've framed it very well. Um, of course, I'm, I'm referring to your comments on the importance of biomethane, um, but of course, I, I would subscribe also to your, uh, your, you know, the, the views on the and the importance of having an evidence base to discuss the future, and that's what we try and provide here at the International Energy Agency. Um, just on your last point, actually, um, I, I, we're having a meeting of our governing board today or well, yesterday and today in Paris, uh, one of the topics that we were talking about this morning was precisely what you just mentioned. So this question of, of flexibility in energy markets, in power markets in particular, and also how you think about flexibility over different time periods, because the technologies that you need for managing short-term flexibility in power markets are gonna be quite difficult, different from the ones that you need to think about seasonal variability. And when you think about seasonal variability, then having storable, dispatchable, low emissions um, sources of, uh, of generation, uh, that's, that's clearly gonna be an incredibly important um, aspect of the future. And indeed, it's one that uh, we were, were talking about just a few minutes ago uh, here. Um, but maybe 
also in terms of broad framing, um, say a couple of words about the, you know, where we are both in Europe and internationally in gas markets. Um, everyone's aware of the shock that we've had uh, in 2022. Um, Russian deliveries by pipeline um, down by something like 80 billion cubic meters um, compared with uh, 2021. And that's made a massive adjustment to all sorts of aspects of the way um, that uh, Europe uses gas and then via LNG markets um, internationally as well. So um, to fill in that gap, Europe has taken a lot more LNG um, and partially from expanded supplies from, from the US, but partially just um, through some shortfalls elsewhere in the world um, and some tight markets. Um, then there has also been policy driven changes. So expansion of renewables, um, improvements on the energy efficiency side. Um, there's also been demand destruction. We've seen that in some gas um, intensive industries. Um, the weather has played obviously an important role and that's given Europe time. It's given Europe time to make some of the more structural changes that will be essential for gas security going forward. And, and that is important because in our view, Europe and global gas markets are not out of the woods yet. Um, we are likely to see continued tightness in gas markets for a, for a, for a few more years yet. Um, it's only in the middle of the 2020s when you get a large new increment of LNG liquefaction facilities coming online um, in the Middle East, in North America. Um, and that would be the moment at which we see some sort of normalization uh, in, in, in gas markets. But through then, um, we do have to be very vigilant, vigilant to, to the risks. And one of the big uncertainties for this year that we should all be, anyone in, involved in any aspect of the gas industry should be, um, uh, should be vigilant about is what happens in China. Um, because China had a very unusual year last year. Gas demand fell. Um, you have to go back to the early 1980s to see something similar. Um, and then insofar as China comes back strongly, and that's still an open question, but insofar as it does, um, that could tighten up um, gas markets quite considerably. So we have been consistent in our view that when you look at the alternative sources of gas uh, for Europe, um, both in a climate context and uh, moving away from natural gas, but also in a, an immediate energy security context, um, you cannot leave biogases, biomethane out of that conversation. Um, and so uh, I'm pleased to and contribute to this discussion uh, today. And maybe if we move on to um, the next uh, slide. So there is a huge untapped um, resource that could scale up biogas, biomethane production. Um, today's high gas prices provide um, a new context to assess its cost competitiveness. Um, but it's not straightforward to assume that high gas prices in themselves or adequ adequate uh, resources um, they're going to do the job on its own. As you mentioned in your introductory words, um, Chris, um, it is going to depend on policies, on waste management, on sustainable feedstocks, low carbon gas certification schemes, CO2 pricing or crediting. Um, they're examples of the sorts of things that we would need to see um, in order to scale up biomethane deployment and realize its multiple uh, coal benefits. And I, there's one other angle that I think we need to have very much in mind, um, and that's that measuring and verifying methane emissions are going to be crucial to demonstrating the environmental benefits of biomethane uh, projects. So I'm going to use the latest data from the World Energy Outlook to explore the out outlook for biomethane in Europe and in the. Um, what I'm going to look at is um, a scenario that we do. So we're assuming that countries meet their climate. Uh, targets. Um, and what you're looking at on the screen now is um, the biomethane potential that we calculate in the European Union. Apologies, it's just the EU uh, for 2030 and compared with the share uh, of natural gas demand in, in 2021. Um, no, first thing to notice is that there's really significant potential compared to the, the 3 BCM that's being uh, produced today. And a lot of that's in Germany, France, Spain, Italy, all countries with significant support. So that's a very positive sign. Um, as a share of, uh, of gas demand, uh, the Nordic countries also have very large potential as well. 
Um, Denmark is already quite a front runner in that respect, um, sources up to two thirds of its total gas demand in the form of biomethane. So we did this assessment only for sustainable feedstocks. And we have 17 categories that feed into that analysis, uh, whether it's food waste, cardboard, manure, you name it. And, and we identified a potential of up to 80 BCM by uh, 2030. And those estimates are at the upper end of what you'll find in the literature. So a what lot depends on assumptions like how much manure can feasibly find its way into a biodigester, and whether you can have rotational crops included, uh, and the potential for forestry in the form of log fellings, uh, round wood, uh, uh, and so on. And if we click through, you can see how that um, breaks down uh, by, by feedstock. And then a next click would take those feedstocks and turn that into a um, supply curve. Um, and so the, that's what uh, we calculate for the supply cost curve biomethane potential um, in, the, in the European Union. And, and you can come up with a pretty wide range of costs associated with producing biomethane. Most of the lower cost potential uh, is in municipal waste and crop residues. Um, things start getting more expensive um, as you move towards other technologies, uh, for instance, uh, biomass um, gasification. It's worth noting that these costs don't include the costs of grid injection. So in some countries in Europe, those costs are socialized, um, notably here in France, um, but in other parts of Europe, the project sponsor has to foot uh, the connection bill. And if we click through, you can see where on that, um, on that cost curve, the repower EU um, target uh, would fall. On the next slide, um, biomethane has a key role in sectors where emissions are, are hard to abate, while biogas potential more a means of providing sort of baseload renewable or flexible renewable um, electricity uh, and, and clean cooking. So today we have around 35 BCM equivalent of biogas consumed uh, around the world. Most local sort of heat, heat and electricity or a clean cooking fuel and less than 20% of that biogas is converted um, to biomethane. But that share um, is growing. And in a scenario in which all countries meet their national climate pledges on time and in full, um, you know, by 2030, something like half of all biogas um, is upgraded uh, to biomethane. And, and a decent amount of that then gets injected into gas grids for use in power industry um, and buildings. The next um, slide um, shows the regional split then um, EU currently um, ahead globally um, with its three BCM of, of biomethane per year. Um, but there is huge momentum uh, for biomethane development, both here in Europe and, and uh, elsewhere in the world. Uh, many countries, because they're facing very high gas prices, policy support is growing. Um, in China, there's a very strong rural development angle to some of that policy support. Um, in Brazil, through Renova uh, Bio and the biomethane credit, um, India also has uh, an emerging body uh, of policy and regulatory support uh, for um, for biomethane. And um, we're not, you know, anyone following developments in the um, United States would also be aware uh, that the Inflation Reduction Act also has tax credits for um, biogas plants built uh, before uh, 2024. So that feeds into a broader narrative that we are uh, that we are identifying for um, the responses to the global energy crisis, that it is reinforcing policy support in many parts of the world for clean technologies. And I think um, biomethane needs to make sure it's very much part of that conversation because it's obviously has direct applicability to the worries that many countries in the world have about their um, gas security. And my final slide um, is about the uses then of biomethane and the role that it plays um, in different aspects of decarbonisation. And in advanced economies, um, the role of biomethane, if we break that down um, into um, the, the different elements that it 
that it replaces in the energy system. You see that biomethane in advanced economies is mostly about substituting for uh, natural gas. Um, whereas in emerging economies, the last click on the other side of the screen, um, the share of gas tends to be a bit lower in most cases. Um, but the case for biomethane um, is, is, is quite different in the sense that it, it is often replacing uh, more polluting fuels. Um, so biomethane there helps to displace coal um, and oil to a significant degree from, um, from those emissions intensive industrial processes or oil based uh, transport. So that's very much embedded in the scenario work that we do at the International Energy Agency. Uh, and I hope it gives you a sense of the way that um, biomethane does play a, a significant role and not just in meeting near-term energy security worries, uh, but also in the way that we think about uh, longer-term decarbonisation uh, objectives. So with that, many thanks for your attention. Very happy to get your thoughts, Chris, and any, any, any comments or questions from, from the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. I think it's a, that was a really useful run over your view of, of what's happening. I'd just like to put in uh, context what the one of the central IEA forecasts for biomethane and biogas uh, to 2030 means just for the UK. Uh, we've got 702 plants. If we were to grow at the rate that the, the IEA is projecting up to 2030, we'd need 1,800 plants, and that's in a pretty short period of time. Now, the great thing about the industry is we can actually build plants in two to three years, whereas if you try and build a nuclear plant, you'll be lucky to get away with under 14 or uh, 17 years, I think. But, Tim, I wanted to ask you, how can we... Have you begun at the IEA to do uh, um, some policy uh, uh, groups with leading countries about how to facilitate the rapid growth of biomethane that you uh, foresee. I'm particularly thinking, you know, over and over again, developers have problems with connecting into the gas grid. Sometimes they're not anywhere near the gas grid. So, you know, in the UK, which is my fault, as I was the Secretary of State at the time, we ended up tying uh, through the renewable heat incentive um, biomethane to the gas grid but perhaps we shouldn't have done. We should actually recognize the flexibility of the technology and make sure that there is actually the possibility of feeding into the electricity grid or into tankered uh, fuels that can be used for transport. How have you begun to, 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 to try and get best practice on policy to support the growth of the industry? I think you've captured something very important about, you know, the where we are with many aspects of the discussions with our member countries uh, and indeed with non-member countries around the world. And by and large, the objectives of policy are now pretty clear. We have in many cases, in most cases, um, a, a degree of consensus around the direction of uh, and, and the 2030 targets, 2050 targets or 2060 targets in some cases. Um, so we're really focusing in on implementation. And as, and as you rightly said, um, you can build a um, facility in one, two, three years. Um, but if you have a target for 2030 and it's going to take you four to six years to proceed with all the permitting, um, then you know, it, it becomes clear very quickly that your 2030 targets are, are out of reach. Um, and so I think we are now in a, in a situation where we're moving down from that high level target setting and getting into the, the meat of a discussion around best practices on all sorts of much more granular and, and normally much more jurisdiction specific discussions around how exactly this is going to happen um, and what sort of um, regulations, practices, administrative practices, uh, you know, even discussions around, you know, how do you ensure that there's adequate staffing then of the administrative bodies that um, that uh, that put to, that, that that allow projects to proceed? Um, th so those are the sorts of things that are very much part of the conversations that we're having now. 
uh, with, uh, with, with countries um, in the IEA. Now, the advantage in a way of a forum like this is that you do have that opportunity to see what works in other parts of the world. Um, and so um, that's why we're obviously welcoming the, um, you know, the, the participation of, of the UK in these discussions amongst many others. One other thing to mention, um, as part of the IEA setup, we have a thing called um, technology collaboration programs. Um, and there is a, a technology collaboration program which looks specifically at um, renewable gases or biomethane, biogases, um, and they are also very active in, in putting together case studies, best practices on, on how this goes in different parts of the world. Great. Thank you very much. Can I abuse the chairmanship by asking you uh, another question? I'm going to open it up to the audience if anybody wants to sort of identify themselves who'd like to come in with a question. Um, one of the things that your counterpart body, um, the OECD, very usefully did in other context was by actually pulling together comparisons uh, of, for example, legal systems and how quickly you could uh, get collateral if you were in the banking sector attempting to repossess or whatever. Um, I wonder it would be really useful for the IEA to pull together information about permitting times uh, so that we could actually have a sort of benchmark and hold the laggards to account. Um, I have an awful feeling that the UK would probably be one of those laggards. Um, so, but it would, it would put some good pressure on people to concentrate their minds on improving the planning process, improving the permitting process. And it's something I think the IEA could very usefully do. Is that something you've considered yet? So we've done it in other areas. Um, but we haven't yet done it uh, specifically for biogas biomethane. Um, there's a big discussion, as, you're, as you know, on uh, permitting for new um, renewable power projects, um, you know, wind, solar in particular. Um, so we have looked at that in some detail. Um, but suggestion noted that we should do the same thing then for, for biogas biomethane. Yeah. I mean, the other, the other issue for many developers uh, all over the world is, is grid connection, whether electricity or gas and how long it actually takes to do that. Can I ask anybody in the audience, uh, would you like to have any more granularity on uh, what uh, Tim has said? Do we have any questions from the audience? Yes, yes. Hello, thank you. Uh, Chris Walters from Lansdowne Moritz. Um, can I ask a, a question about whether the IEA does any work on um, looking at wh whether you envisage a world where biomethane is produced subsidy free and what you think it might take for that to happen on a global basis. Did you hear that, Tim? Yeah. I mean, you actually have a rather good cost curve there, which I, I need to look at it more closely, but quite a lot of, I mean, do you want to tell us about it? Yeah, so we have a, a, quite a granular view on biomethane um, supply costs um, in different parts of the world, um, from different feedstocks, different processes. Um, what that suggests is that, you know, it takes quite an exceptional year, and we certainly had an exceptional year last year, um, for that to be cost competitive in the absence of some sort of additional policy intervention. Now, in our view, those biomethane costs, uh, supply costs, they do come down over time as the available feedstocks um, evolve. Um, there is a degree of technology learning uh, as well, although not as spectacular as we've seen uh, for, for some other parts of the energy system. Um, and then, so it really depends on your view on the costs of, um, of competing fuels and technologies. And that's where we come into a, a discussion around um, to what extent are externalities priced in for, uh, for natural gas, um, and to what extent can you have some long-term visibility on the conditions under which um, you know, biogases are introduced to the system. So we're all aware of the mechanisms that are in play today uh, for that. Um, you know, in our scenarios, at a point 
you know, at a certain point, the assumed carbon price does get high enough um, to make um, the, you know, biogases um, cost competitive, as it were, without, um, you know, additional measures. Um, but our view is probably that you will need a degree of, of policy support, whether that's through things like contracts for difference or some mechanism um, that would give uh, a degree of revenue security for the future um, in order to make sure that we get investment through in the in the volumes that are needed. And I, I, I would just like to pick up also the point that Chris made about the, um, the grids and infrastructure, because for us, that's really crucial. And that's another area where you have a potential mismatch between your ability to get a um, a, a supply project together and your ability to actually deliver into the system. Um, we, we're very conscious of that in electricity and we're also conscious of that uh, when it comes to connections for um, uh, biogas projects to, uh, to, to the grid and that can sometimes be an important barrier. Yeah. Just looking at, um, Tim, looking at your, at the, the, the sort of integration of carbon market revenues into uh, biogas and biomethane, uh, what's your the point at which you think that the carbon price and what is the level of the carbon price at which you think biomethane and biogas ought to be able to wash its face as an otherwise unsubsidized uh, renewable? Um, you can look at it just in terms of the carbon price and I'm happy to, to you know, get these numbers together and, and, and bring, but I think it also depends on whether you're What's the system also for crediting on the methane side? Um, because that in practice has a very important um, effect too on the cost competitiveness of, uh, of all of this. Um, and then when we get into that, that, that methane discussion, um, it's a big area of uncertainty still for, for many biogases. Um, so what we're urging countries to do is to make sure that they have mechanisms in place that allow for measuring reporting uh, and verification uh, of emissions from biogas and biomethane plants. And um, so some studies, and I'm sure everyone's seen them, uh, would place the leakage rate uh, of up to seven to eight percent of produced biogas. And that's far higher than the sort of estimates that you'll see for um, oil and gas. Now, whether that leads to a sort of additional emissions, then it depends on the feedstock. Um, but we would very much encourage the industry to get ahead of that debate, because I think it's going to be a really important one uh, for uh, for future calculations also of, of the of the sort of of the point that you're 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 making, Chris, about that, that when you can consider that to be net positive for him for the environment, but also then, um, you know, a, a crucial element of the the comparative um, um, uh, sort of the the competitiveness versus natural gas. Absolutely. Well, Thank you for that. And certainly the certification scheme is one way of improving practice in the industry and trying to make sure that we don't have those sort of uh, leakages. My hunch is that it's relatively easy to fix a lot of those and that people just need to concentrate on, on doing so. Um, I, I just one question, if I may, on the, uh, on the ETS and the fact that Brussels is now looking at uh, trying to uh, provide the benefits of the ETS to the sector. Do you have a view on the best way of doing that? I have to say that's not something I've looked at, um, you know, personally. Um, but, um, you know, in, in our view, anything that that brings these externalities into this kind of discussion is, is uh, in principle, a good thing. I've not looked at the detail. Yeah, great. Any other questions from the audience? Because I know that Tim's got a uh, a, a very hard stop in uh, uh, less than two minutes, but a, a last quick question uh, we could probably uh, accommodate. But if not, Tim, thank you very much indeed for giving us the overview. The IEA, as I say, is all going to continue to be a reference point uh, for uh, the forecasting. And you are, are having a, a considerable influence, I know, on a lot of potential investors in what you're saying about biomethane and about biogas. So thank you for all the work that you're doing in trying to ground uh, the future forecasts on the basis of some really good research on feedstocks, regulation and so forth. And all power to your elbow. I hope that it, you continue doing that and, and hope too that you benchmark some of our governments so that 
uh, we can improve the laggards up to um, uh, some of the better acting and faster acting uh, policy actors. Thank you. No, we'll be happy to do that. Thanks a lot, uh, Chris, for the, for the chat and, and thanks for, to everyone who joined today.